The final item of business today is the Members' Business Debate on Motion Number 15580 in the name of Dennis Robertson on Eating Disorder Awareness Week 2016. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. I call on Dennis Robertson to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Robertson. Yeah, okay. hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and can I begin by um, thanking all the members for supporting the motion and indeed the members who have stayed back this evening uh, in, in this uh, very late uh, uh, evening uh, within the chamber. Uh, this is a, a historic day for this parliament, a uh, presiding officer, given that we've actually uh, had, a, in principle anyway, an agreement with the UK government in, in the, our fiscal settlement for the devolved powers. And I'm sure that will take the headlines tomorrow. But what I hope is for this evening that at least what I'm about to say will be uh, reported at some point and remain within, I think, the agenda, I sincerely hope, of the next Scottish Government. We've seen a great deal of movement within eating disorders over the past five years. And this, I think, is partly due to the debates that we've had in this Parliament, but again, I think, to the commitment of the Scottish Government in taking the whole aspect of eating disorders seriously. Accepting that it is a mental illness and looking at it maybe from a different perspective than was maybe the case beforehand, I think is has helped to bring uh, us much further on. And indeed, I reflect where we were five years ago <clears throat> and where I was five years ago. And indeed, five years ago, on the 25th of February, the date that Caroline died because of an eating disorder, uh, I felt the pain then and I feel the pain now. The pain I feel now is perhaps slightly different because the pain I feel now is not just in terms of the grieving because I miss Caroline very much, uh, as does Anne and her Caroline's twin sister Fiona. Of course we miss her. But we continue to look at trying to establish a pathway so that other people don't have to go through the anguish and the pain that we had gone through at that time. And I think we've made significant gains in that area. But what confuses me, presiding officer, is when I look at the various websites in eating disorders. And when we're trying to look at, I think, providing the best possible care for those with an eating disorder, the confusion is that the statistics and the way we measure is all over the place. For instance, if you look at beat statistics and then the London School of Economics and then the, the various other eating disorder statistics, we now realise that you know, there's percentages of, is it one in 100 women? Is it one in 250 women? But what I would say, presiding officer, is regardless of the statistics, the fact remains that eating disorders is on the increase. And I think it's something that we need to be careful about and actually recognise, because it's on the increase within our, our younger population. And we must address it. Now, I'm not saying for one moment that anorexia or bulimia is on the increase, because those seem to be fairly stable. But eating disorders with non sort of specific diagnosis is certainly on the increase, and including things like binge eating. And what we do know is that, and what um, we recognise is that there's peer pressure. And part of that, and what I was interested in was a phrase that, that came from one of the, the sites I was reading, is that eating disorders seems to have become a socially transmitted disease. Now, when I thought about that, I, I wondered really, you know, what does it mean? And when I looked into the facts, it's about the fashion industry again. And it's about this body image. And it's about how we see ourselves and how other people perceive what we should be. This is something we can probably address. 
And as governments, both here in Scotland and I think in the UK, we can actually look at how this imagery is there and what influence it does have on our young people. But what I want to say, perhaps, to the minister is that if we're going to do the best that we possibly can for our young people with eating disorders, we must be clear about what an eating disorder is. We must be able to detect it at the early stages. And we must therefore be able to provide the best possible treatment and therapy. The relapse for people with eating disorders just now, presiding officer, regardless of therapy, is somewhere between 60 to 70 percent. That's a relapse of 60 to 70 percent. That's not good. We still have young people dying. Um, and although, again, I think that number has stabilized, it's not good. So if we are going to make that difference, if we are actually going to do the best that we possibly can, let's think about what we can do. And what I ask the minister is that, can we have a system whereby we record our eating disorders? Can we have a system whereby, where, whereby we actually look at the therapies available? And family-based therapies are certainly available and they're certainly the, the, the most effective. But then again, we don't have enough trained specialists. So perhaps some of the mental health monies that we are having uh, that has come across from mental health could be going towards the education of people with, to, to give them that expertise within family-based therapies and certainly to treat the eating disorders within the community. I still get emails and correspondence from people that are struggling with eating disorders and their children because they don't know where to turn. I think we should be establishing, hopefully, uh, whether it be uh, a governmental website or, or, or something like that. But certainly the groups that are out there are coming forward. And, and in this week, on Friday, I have another uh, eating disorder conference here in Parliament. And what I want to say, I think, finally, is that Scotland can lead the way, perhaps, in looking at... I, there, is no, there is no magic bullet. There is no, we, can't, we can't stop people having eating disorders. We will always have that. But what I want to say, I think, finally, is this legacy for my daughter is important to me and is important to, I think, every other person with an eating disorder. And we need to have a quality service a quality service that is meaningful to those young people and is there to help the families. And it is this family support that is essential and it is the family support that I hope that we can focus on. And in the next parliament, I sincerely hope that the government will consider having a debate specifically on eating disorders and perhaps even the committee could look at how we best provide services for those with eating disorders. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate speeches of four minutes, please. I call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by David Torrance. Uh, Presiding Officer, this is, I believe, the fourth year that I've had cause to thank Dennis Robertson for bringing discussion of eating disorders to the Parliament. It's a subject of profound importance, and this week affords an opportunity to reach out to sufferers, to challenge stigma, and to make a clear statement that this is a mental health problem with very serious physical and emotional repercussions. Many people in this chamber will know someone who has been drawn into this debilitating and isolating world. An eating disorder often starts as a coping mechanism, a means of exerting control over one's body or of punishing your body until it fits society's predetermined mould. It chips away at a person's life day by day and sometimes it envelops them entirely. We must resolutely challenge any preconception that these are shameful or self-indulgent conditions. An eating disorder is not a phase. And those who suffer have a right to be understood, helped and heard. 
Doing this starts with prevention, teaching about healthy body images to children from an early age and in schools, and helping them develop a critical response to media and advertising messages. It also means ensuring educational psychologists in schools and GPs in communities have the resources available to identify children who might be at risk of developing negative coping behaviours. At the same time, information on finding support for recovery must be widely available, helping individuals find the strength to self-refer to their GP. And when they do, they must receive appropriate and accessible treatment within the target time of 18 weeks. I mentioned just now the need to provide information and support more widely, and the motion rightly notes the excellent work of the Scottish Eating Disorders Interest Group. This is an invaluable resource that both connects communities of interest with professional advice and services, and also encourages carers and sufferers to share their own experiences to inform research. Their site allows sufferers, carers, and medical professionals alike to become members and to use resources like case studies, useful books, and links to relevant websites. They also share details of services in specific areas and offer advice on steps to take when seeking help with referral and recovery. I very much look forward to meeting some of their members at EDAW 2016 Scotland's Journey Quality Eating Disorder Services, which Dennis Robertson is hosting. This will take place on Friday and will for the first time include a specific discussion on males with eating disorders. We must remember that while this is an illness that predominantly affects women, many young boys and men also find themselves trapped in this seemingly endless cycle and are equally afraid to reach out. Um, well, I, I'll briefly... Kevin Stewart. Mr Chisholm, for giving way, it's the second year that the conference will look at men and boys, and I think that's immensely important. Uh, and uh, Dennis has done much to bring that to light. Uh, and I would congratulate the charity MBEADS, which is based in Aberdeen, for the work that they've been doing to highlight eating disorders in men and boys. Malcolm Chisholm. Thanks for um, reinforcing that point. Uh, finding the right path to recovery starts with an informed and sensitive GP, who recognises the real courage it takes to present as a patient with an eating disorder. This cannot be emphasised enough. Recovery starts when a person builds up the courage to speak out. The GP is the vital first step. They then direct that vulnerable person to the correct door. In September 2015, the charity See Me funded the group Seen But Not Heard, a collective advocacy eating disorder project to produce a GP resource pack about eating disorders. Um, it was called Living with an Eating Disorder, What You Need to Know. It includes a poster for raising awareness in the surgery, a booklet available in the waiting room for people with eating disorders, as well as the general public to take away, and an information leaflet for GPs and other members of the primary care team. This GP resource pack was developed by people who have a lived experience of eating disorders to produce crucial information that can help GPs gain a better understanding of how to offer effective, appropriate care and treatment. In conclusion, uh, this is the fourth and final time that I will speak here in support of Dennis Robertson. I do so in solidarity with all of those people, young and old alike, who fight a daily battle with food and a daily battle with the unseen dark force that takes control, wears them down and sometimes does not let go. We must let them know that the battle is not theirs to fight alone. We recognise them this week and every week. And I thank Dennis Robertson again for ensuring that we never forget them. And can I apologise because in two minutes' time, I have to be at the Devo uh, Moore Parish Committee to question uh, David Mandel. So apologies to Dennis Robertson, the presiding officer and the minister. Many thanks. I now call David Torrance to be followed by Nanette Milne. Thank you, presiding officer. I want to join Dennis Robertson in welcoming Eating Disorders Awareness Week 2016. In his motion, he highlights much progress has been made over the last five years, both in the terms of raising awareness for eating disorders and ensuring that all patients have access to services they need. I understand that Eating Disorder Week is an international initiative to tackle misconceptions surrounding eating disorders. This year's focus is on the workplace, how colleagues and employees can support someone's recovery. This already shows how complex eating disorders are. Eating disorders affect all aspects of a person's life, relationships with family and friends, ability to perform well at school or at work, and most importantly, eating disorders can have a serious long-term impact on physical health. I believe it is also important to know that eating disorders are long-term conditions. Around half of all affected people take six years or more to recover. The majority of patients first experience symptoms under the age of 16 and many sufferers wait more than a year before seeking treatment. 
According to Beat Eating Disorders UK, around 63% of patients relapse, and the Royal College of Psychiatrists report that anorexia nervosa has the highest morality rate of all psychiatric disorders. What are the implications of these facts? As Dr. Robert Dennison, an expert in eating disorders, has pointed out, more action needs to be taken to support early intervention and prevent deaths. Without a doubt, early intervention is crucial. Research has shown that earlier people with eating disorders seek treatment, the less likely they are to experience relapse and have a greater chance of a full recovery. However, we need to recognise that, that individuals find it extremely difficult to seek help. Eating disorders seriously affect mental and physical health, and many sufferers also exp experience depression, personality disorder, and substance abuse. This is why support is so crucial. Often, such support comes from small non-for-profit organisations. As an example, in my constituency in Fife, Linda Treble Foundation organises regular support group meetings for people with eating disorders, as well as their families. Overall, there has been many positive developments, but more attention needs to be given to support individuals with eating disorders. Once diagnosed, more needs to be done to ensure that patients receive effective care in hospital, at home, university, or in any other environment. There is also still a lack of services, especially in more rural areas of Scotland. In Fife, the only anorexic nervosa intensive treatment team, which is part of Stristine Hospital, has limited capacity and can therefore not accept all referrals. However, today I also want to take the opportunity to commend the dedication of all NHS staff, GPs and organisations supporting people with, with eating disorders. Treating eating disorders requires the close cooperation of all involved, and the new projects are proving to be very promising. In Dumfries and Galway, a new approach has been undertaken by local GPs to ensure that patients receive the right care, it involves monitoring the physical health of people with eating disorders, through biannual training and specific guidance from a resource park aimed at identifying and treating eating disorders. Of course, we cannot be oblivious to the fact that these projects require funding, and I am pleased that the Scottish Government is committed to strengthening mental health services. This is important for many reasons. Apart from the human impact, mental health is a substantial economic burden. Across the UK, 725,000 people su suffer from eating disorders. Many of these affect it note a financial loss due to the detrimental effect of eating disorder has had on their educational development, or if they are already in the workplace, the times they need to take off work. As a result, the sufferers sometimes become dependent on carers, family members and friends to survive. Beyond the personal cost, treatment costs the health sector between 3.9 and 4.6 billion across the UK. Although this economic burden is only a small part of many different effects, people with eating disorders suffer over a prolonged period of time, it is important to acknowledge the cumulative effect of all the factors involved. As I said in the beginning, diagnosing, treating and promoting long-term recovery of eating disorders is complex. However, there are many indi indicators to show that the service provides for those with eating disorders continue to develop and expand on a range of treatment options available. The increased access to effective treatment will hopefully provide beneficial to all those who most need it. We must continue to support and help both those who suffer from eating disorders and those who seek help. Many thanks. I now call on Nanette Mill. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. In the five-year term of this Parliament, Dennis Robertson has brought the issue of eating disorders to the Chamber on numerous occasions through debates and questions, and I'm sure, should he be re-elected, that that will continue. From dealing with the effect on females of mannequins and size 10 models with the body beautiful to the rising problem of eating disorders in young men and boys, we can be proud of continually raising awareness of these conditions, thanks in no small measure to Dennis Robertson's persistent efforts. As an international awareness event which stretches across the globe, Eating Disorders Week has clearly become a fixture in many countries' calendars. The pivotal point of the week is it helps to bring people together, those affected as individuals, in the medical profession or as carers. And as we all know, many carers are family members. I note that on Friday there will be a day-long conference here in Edinburgh organised by the Scottish Eating Disorders Interest Group and hosted by Dennis Robertson. It's organisations like this which do so much to raise awareness of eating disorders, but it's not only conferences that help. There are many fun events such as live bands, pub nights, cake bakings and so on, all to raise money for various eating disorder charities. 
In previous debates, I've referred to the number of celebrities and those in public life who've come forward to talk of their condition. Now, though I don't watch it myself, I did read about the Emmerdale actress, Gemma Oten, who's spoken movingly about her own battle with anorexia. She said she was doing this ahead of Eating Disorders Awareness Week to highlight the bullying that she had endured, but also to demonstrate that eating disorders can affect people from all backgrounds and all walks of life. Gemma also referred to anorexia as a recognised mental health condition, and we cannot re reiterate this enough. But sadly, there remains a stigma, not only in relation to mental health issues, but also to eating disorders as mental health conditions. That stigma is largely brought about through misunderstanding and ignorance, and there remain a significant number of people who believe that conditions such as anorexia or bulimia are largely about individuals with fatty eating habits. That's clearly not the case, and those who suffer from these disorders should be referred promptly for the psychological support and the psychiatric help which they and their families need. One area which requires closer scrutiny is the recognition of eating disorders out with teenagers and young adults. It's telling that the UK's leading eating disorders charity, BEAT, has chosen as its theme this year, eating disorders in the workplace, which will concentrate on the impact that these disorders can have in the workplace and highlighting what individuals, colleagues and employers can do to support someone's recovery at work. The motion makes mention of the Scottish Government's additional mental health spending, and I do recognise there has been a significant investment which will cover the next four years. Additionally, the Prime Minister pledged in January of this year a revolution in mental health treatment, with a commitment from 2018 that all teenagers suffering with eating disorders will be seen within a month of being referred, or within a week for urgent cases, and additional resources and funding are being made available. The motion refers, rightly, to the commitment of the Scottish Government to seek improvements in the treatment of people living with eating disorders, but I hope the Minister and members will also appreciate the similar commitment given by the UK Government, because I think this is one area where there has to be greater cooperation north and south of the border to tackle a condition which for too long hasn't been taken seriously enough by society and its elected representatives. Presiding officer, if I got him right, I think Dennis Robertson hinted about the need for a managed clinical network across Scotland to deal with the various issues associated with eating disorders, and I'd be very supportive of such a scheme, which would help to ensure equity in accessing treatment for those affected and their families. Finally, as this will undoubtedly be my last speech in this chamber regarding eating disorders, can I thank all members who've worked together over the years to improve the lives of the individuals involved with what can often be tragic circumstances. I wish them well, and I look forward to hearing about the progress they make in continuing to raise awareness of these conditions in the next Parliament. Thank you. Many thanks. Can I now invite Jamie Hepburn to respond to the debate minister? Seven minutes or so, please. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Can I uh, begin by joining others in congratulating Dennis Robertson for uh, securing uh, today's uh, debate? Uh, as Nanette uh, Milne set out this, it uh, continues uh, Dennis Robertson's uh, long standing uh, interest in bringing these matters to uh, this uh, parliamentary uh, chamber. Uh, and I want to uh, thank him for, for bringing this uh, debate uh, before us uh, this evening. Can I also thank him? for speaking very movingly about his own family's own personal experience. I know that it can't have been easy for him to do so, and I don't think any of us could fail to be moved by him doing so. And I think it is also very important to hear about such experience, and it does also reflect the point that Nanette Milne made about others who have spoken publicly about their own challenges, their own struggles with eating disorder. I would recognise it's never easy for individuals to come forward and talk on uh, that basis about their own uh, challenges with uh, not necessarily just eating disorder but any uh, form of mental health uh, challenge but uh, those who do uh, so do as a great uh, service because it helps us uh, challenge the uh, tremendous uh, issues of stigmatisation that we know uh, still uh, pervade and still uh, exist. Uh, Dennis Robertson and Malcolm Chisholm uh, mentioned the uh, conference that will take place uh, on uh, this Friday. I'm uh, sorry that I am unable to personally uh, attend, but I look forward to uh, hearing some of its uh, outcomes. I am very uh, pleased to be able to uh, respond to uh, this debate on behalf of the, the Scottish Government. It gives uh, me the opportunity to join others in uh, marking uh, Eating Disorder Awareness Week this year and to uh, recognise the efforts of all those uh, people and organisations uh, across the country working to raise awareness of uh, eating disorders, including the 
the Scottish Eating Disorder Interest Group. I would uh, very much associate myself with the remarks of uh, Malcolm Chisholm uh, earlier about the nature and the impact of uh, eating disorder as a, a serious uh, mental health uh, problem. And it may be the uh, last opportunity for uh, him to, uh, for me to uh, remark on uh, it. So I should take the opportunity. I know he is uh, standing down at the election and I want to pay tribute to the work uh, the interest that he has shown in mental health over the years, and similarly uh, to Nanette Milne, if I don't get the opportunity between now and a solution to, to pay tribute to uh, the work she has undertaken uh, in the time that she's been an elected uh, representative. Uh, I've listened very carefully to the, uh, the range of, of comments and issues raised uh, during the debate. I want to assure members of the, the Scottish Government's uh, commitment to uh, doing all it can to uh, tackle uh, eating uh, disorders and further improving care service and support. One of the issues raised by both Dennis Robertson and uh, Nanette Milne, uh, they both raised the impact of the fashion industry. We know that uh, BEAT, which is of course a UK-wide uh, eating disorder charity, they acknowledge that influences are, are wide-ranging. And whilst uh, the media and uh, fashion industry uh, don't necessarily directly uh, cause eating disorder, I think we would all agree their influence cannot uh, be ignored. See me, uh, who of course the Scottish Government helps uh, fund work uh, to uh, promote mental health and well-being, including a positive uh, body image through the uh, benefits of a healthy uh, lifestyle and diet. So there is work underway by that organisation. But let me be clear, I would accept, uh, President Officer, more uh, can always be done. And I would call on all those uh, responsible, including retailers in the uh, fashion industry, to play their part in tackling unhelpful or unrealistic ideals which can uh, contribute to unhealthy uh, lifestyles. Uh, let me turn to uh, some of the work that's uh, been underway. Our uh, improvement agenda has been driven forward over the last few years through uh, delivery of the National Mental Health and Suicide Prevention uh, Strategies. We will be uh, publishing a new uh, three-year mental health strategy uh, later uh, this year. I met with uh, Dennis Robertson last year to discuss the uh, important issue of eating disorders as part of uh, the engagement process around uh, that uh, strategy. No decisions have uh, been made in the, the content of the strategy, but in maintain, maintaining a continuity with the work which has already, already been uh, progressed uh, over recent years. Some uh, priorities naturally emerge. I expect a new uh, strategy to focus on encouraging development of new models of managing uh, mental health problems in uh, primary care. I anticipate a focus on uh, child and adolescent mental health and uh, on better responses uh, to distress. There will also be a focus on developing measuring outcomes for improved uh, mental health. These are, are broad uh, priorities at present, but there are, are clear links in there to eating disorder uh, care will developing the uh, detail over the coming months as the strategy is finalised. There are uh, of opportunities for uh, Mr Robertson and indeed any uh, member uh, of this uh, parliament uh, and those that uh, Dennis Robertson works with on uh, eating disorders to contribute to the process for uh, the new uh, mental health uh, strategy. And that could, of course, include any conclusions from uh, the conference on Friday. I'd be very uh, happy uh, for such uh, contributions. It's uh, important to look uh, forward, uh, President Officer, but also to look back at some of the successes we have had. I was uh, able, at uh, Mr Robertson's invitation, to visit both the adult and young people's eating disorder services in NHS Grampian in July uh, last year. I spoke to staff working on the front line. I spoke to families and those who use the service to see it firsthand, impressive care and support which is delivered uh, day in, uh, day out. I saw the Royal College's uh, marzipan guidance being used to uh, better manage really sick uh, patients with anorexia. I heard about the wide range of uh, treatments available and the benefits of improved access to uh, therapies, including increased availability of uh, family therapy. It's clear uh, there's great work taking place in the North East. I would like to thank uh, Dennis Robertson uh, for uh, arranging for me uh, to uh, visit. Uh, members uh, talked about some of the, uh, the funding uh, decisions that uh, we have made. It's been part of the uh, significant uh, £150 million pounds additional investment the Scottish Government uh, recently announced for improving uh, mental health and wellbeing will uh, contribute directly to the, uh, the, uh, the aim of uh, working closely with NHS Scotland and uh, their partners to ensure we offer the best quality of life and opportunities for all people with uh, mental health problems, including uh, those living with uh, an eating uh, disorder. The First Minister announced in January that part of that funding, £54.1 million, will uh, go towards directly improving access to mental health services for uh, adults and uh, uh, children. Uh, the uh, part of that uh, funding that the First Minister announced is directly uh, related to the, uh, the point that David Torrance made about the requirement, uh, the point that's been raised as part of Eating Disorder Awareness Week, uh, focusing on the need for the responsiveness of uh, the workforce. We need to ensure the 
that uh, the workforce has the requisite skill set and part of the funding that First Minister announced will be used to improve uh, the workforce supply, but also training existing staff to uh, better deliver uh, services uh, for children and young people, as well as psychological therapies for all uh, ages. Uh, Malcolm Chisholm spoke uh, about the importance of uh, primary care and uh, general practitioners, uh, and uh, again, as part of the funding that we are, uh, only 10 million uh, over the next three years is going directly to improve mental health support in uh, primary care. I would absolutely agree that we need to have a, a better response to the challenges of poor uh, mental health in primary uh, care uh, settings. Uh, the bulk of this additional investment will be invested from next year. It will, of course, take time to deliver results, but I do believe it will uh, make a difference to the manner in which we support those with uh, poor mental health, including those who present with eating uh, disorder. Dennis Robertson uh, made a request that we utilise some of the, uh, the remainder of the funding specifically for uh, eating disorders. I will, of course, be very happy to consider any a specific uh, proposition. We haven't decided how the entirety of the funding will be utilised, so I'll be very happy to uh, speak with him uh, further about that uh, matter. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, what I've set out, President Officer, demonstrates that there is a great deal of work uh, taking place uh, by partners across all uh, sectors to tackle uh, eating disorders and wider uh, mental uh, health problems. Dennis Robertson hopes, uh, expressed his hopes, that the agenda on eating disorders remain, retains its prominence politically after the Scottish Parliament election. I'm confident that will be the case. I think picking up on the point that Annette Milne raised, this isn't a political uh, or a partisan political issue. This is a shared agenda. I'm sure it will remain high on the political agenda. It's right we recognise eating disorder awareness week, reaffirm our commitment to deliver on our ambitions for improved outcomes and quality of life for all those living with eating disorder. And on that basis, uh, President Officer, I want to thank Dennis Robertson for providing us with the opportunity to do that this evening. Thank you, Minister. And that concludes Dennis Robertson's debate, Eating Disordered Awareness Week 2016. I thank members for participating, and particularly those who will not be speaking again on this subject. I now close this meeting of Parliament.